Welcome everyone to Hot Talk, coming to you live from Kota Kinabalu in Sabah in Malaysia. You know, Hot Talk, as I've always said, is about heart-to-heart -heart conversations with inspiring personalities from different parts of the world. And one such personality today is going to change your life as much as it does mine. And the reason is being that life is all about interacting. You know, as a surgeon, I interact with my patient. And today we're going to talk about the whole world of interacting between a writer and a reader. Now, in the medical field, we always go back to the spirit of the 1900s, you know, when the birth of plastic surgery started. And we talk about Harold Gillies. Until today, I use his instruments with his name on it. And the first thing we were taught was to go and learn the history behind that instrument and who crafted it. And this is the whole history of how you enter into the spirit of that era. Now, you know, as a doctor, we are, we are always trained, do no harm. And always at the end of the six years of training, it's about making a diagnosis and giving the right treatment. So too with this whole philosophy, this whole phenomenon, this whole craft of writing. And this is one of my series, I think it's episode number seven, uh, which talks about how do you really think through the process of the mind behind the mind, the thinking process, and try and touch into the spirit and the culture of writing and being a good writer. So my guest today uh, is exceptional because she's an award-winning developmental editor. She's a book collaborator. She's a ghostwriter and whose clients have earned more than 55 book awards and bestseller rankings. Her name is Kristin Iris. She specializes in working on high impact nonfiction with academics, physicians, researchers. And I can tell you one thing, she's truly a professional in what she does. And I call her the book doctor, especially in the field of forensic because she knows how to really get into the heart of the matter which is a matter of the heart. So I want you to think through with me as she talks about certain issues of writing and uh, which you won't get anywhere else, I promise you. And with a mountain of experience, I can tell you one thing. If, you're, if you want to be a writer and you want to do your memoir and you want to be good at it, Kristen Iris is the one to meet. So join me to welcome Kristen Iris coming to us live from Idaho. Welcome. Kristen. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here and get to talk to you again. You know, Kristen, I tell you that the more I talk to you, the more I, I, I keep on telling you, and it might happen, you know, I might end up being your neighbor because uh, <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be a, a, a really touch-go phrase between the both of us. But I want to tell you that uh, I really enjoyed my last conversation with you, which is going to be really enriching today. Um, and I want to just start off this whole podcast with you, Kristen, and take you back to the time um, when writing was an era of, of new mechanics, you know, the, the new evolution of a revolution uh, in putting pen to paper, in putting thoughts, and how thoughts become sentences, and they become ideas, and then they end up with innovative changes and life-changing, you know, processes. So I want to take you back, and I was looking through how to get a thumbnail for this podcast, you know, the video when it's completed. And I came across a picture of a writer in the name of E.B. White. And I can tell you one thing, Kristen. I mean, my introduction with you might be a little bit long, but I want to get, I want to get the listeners to feel where I'm coming from because you're going to take both of us there. And it took me about 10 minutes. I kept staring at the picture, every part of it. It was taken by a lady by the name of uh, Jill, Jill Kretzmanns. And... Um, it's amazing that, you know, he's 77 years old, white hat. He's sitting on a wooden bench. He's got a wooden table with three planks put together. And he's and looking out the window, he's got the ocean there. He's in his boathouse. And this is in Upper Brooklyn in Maine. And, you know, he's got a waste paper basket. And he's in a world in the spirit. He's captured, the picture captures the spirit of that time, the culture behind writing. And... Uh, it's amazing that today the typewriter is replaced by the computer. Uh, there are no more, more, no more waste paper basket. It's all delete. <laughs> and as we move into this transition of AI coming in and chat GPT and bot and don't know what else is in the, in the process, I want you to talk to us about the ethos behind writing. 
You know, what, what, what is the right of thinking about? Because at the end of the day, as I said in my introduction, it's an interaction between the reader and the author or the writer. And so I want you to help us ca capture the culture of the era, the, the spirit behind. I mean, before, you know, even if you talk about that, what got you into this world of writing? Uh, something must have triggered that inner part of you because it, it's really about the inner self that comes out. And when you listen to 55 other editors or writers and you're walking with them and all that, you, you're going really deep, deeper than a page uh, to be able to formulate and articulate it. So talk to us about the intangibles that produce good writing in memoir, confidence, enjoyment, intention, integrity. How do you put all these qualities and core values in to make a good book that will persuade the reader to buy it? Yeah, I think when I think about that that picture that you're talking about and going back to the before times when we didn't have computers and that kind of thing, I, I think what motivated writers back then was the craft. And it was an expression that they could not not do. And the difference between that and what I see today, especially in the nonfiction world, is that there's been this big push in nonfiction for you know, business people write a book because it's going to draw attention to your business is what can help you earn more money. And so that's not always bad. And I certainly work with a lot of clients that that's part of what they're doing, but the motivation is different. And the way that those authors approach the writing process is completely different. So I love to work with somebody who has more of a craftsman mindset and who is interested in the nuances of things. And if, if we think about craftsmanship from like a woodworking perspective, the, a craftsperson is somebody who's paying particular attention to how the joints of a, a project, you know, the joints of a drawer fit together. Not just that they're for precision, but for beauty as well. So there's just this attention to the writer and or to the actual craft and thinking about it, the fulfillment that the person gets from doing an excellent job and developing their craft, but also thinking about how it's going to be used by the person who purchases the, the piece of, the, you know, the, the bureau or the whatever it is that, that the craftsperson is making. So there's this, when you said in your introduction about me, about the, the heart of it and the heart of it, right? To me, that's that's the difference between a writer and an author. And I make that distinction. Anybody can write a book. And once you write a book, you get that author status. And that's great. Nobody can take that away from you. But a writer is a different animal. They're nice. not in it for status, for the money. They're in it for the craft and for the conversation that, that they have, that their heart has with the heart of the reader and the way that that's facilitated is through words on paper. Wow, that's that's powerful because that distinction is is seldom uh, mentioned or thought about because we kind of like interplay it and use it anytime we like the writer and the author and all that. Um, and and to be able to go back to that spirit, that culture at that time, and then thirty years later, somebody else writes another book about writing well, and they learn from that. And then 30 years later, you know, I'm sitting here or 40, 50 years later, I'm sitting here with Iris, Kristen Iris, and she says, I see you, Charles, you know, Iris to Iris. <laughs> but tell me, how important are those intangibles in the sense of, for example, let's take them one, confidence. Um, I tell you something, this writing of my memoir is huge task. I mean, every time I sit on it, I find myself getting up to go and have a drink, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> any, yeah. any excuse, you know, where's the wine? Where's this, you know? And and uh, because, and I tell you why, as you said, and I love the way you say it, it's a craft. Mm -hmm. And it's just like plastic surgery. I mean, you know, there are only about 40, 50 kind of plastic surgeons in this country. Uh, and, and it takes you so many years to learn the craft. So have we lost those important intangibles in the process. I mean, you mentioned just now about those editors you know, trying to get a book out because it's so business oriented today, especially eBooks. You know, I mean, how do you get an eBook out there and feel who's writing it? It's all about how to, how to, how to. 
as opposed to what am I doing wrong in my life? Uh, and uh, and how do I get that? Part? So talk to me about the credibility, the trustworthiness, the authenticity. Um, that's a big difference, isn't it, between nonfiction and fiction, especially in memoir? Is that is that a play, way to put it? I don't think I'd necessarily say that. Um, how do you put those things? In? I think that novelists are more driven by a desire to tell stories and to entertain people. So I think that there's less of a profit motive there on that side in general. But if there's a really funny thing that people who don't know the industry, you can kind of test and easily see who knows anything about the publishing industry and who doesn't, because there are still a huge number of people out there who think that the way to make a lot of money is to write a book. And writing a book is a great way to lose a lot of money. So there are some <laughs> novelists who come into it thinking that they're going to get fame and fortune by writing a novel, right? Um, but I do think in general, they're more driven by storytelling and a, the craft side of it, maybe. Um, I feel like I'm not really getting to the heart of your question. Uh, but I will address something you you said a minute ago about the marketing part. I think that's also something that is certainly a difference between like that picture of E.B. White and and certainly in the past where really the, the writer's job, the author's job was to create something of value for the reader. And then it was the publisher's job to, to package the book in, into something that was, you know, a product. And it was the marketer's job to market the book and sell the book. And now there's so much pressure on authors to think like business people. And I think that's wise in a lot of ways. I'm very business oriented myself, but I think that that is something that has really crushed the spirit of a lot of writers. And a lot of people who come to me say, I just want to write. I, I don't want to have to think about that. And them having being forced to think about that because they're in this ecosystem that's all about the author doing everything they can to also market their book and bring money in really sucks their creative energy away. And I think that's a really bad thing. I would really like to see us get into a, a better balance where those authors who really want to do the business part and the writing part can go and do their thing. Like in the self-publishing world, I mean, there's some awesome writers who are doing it all and, and they're great at that. But to, to create that lane again and carve out that space for craftspeople who really just want to spend all their time digging into the craft and digging deep into themselves to say, what is it that I'm really trying to say and why does it matter and to whom does it matter? Oh, beautifully said, because that's deep and that's powerful because it's real. Uh, that means to say there is an intention and that intention must be authentic, that you're, you're there because your life has changed and you mm -hmm. want the person reading it. So talk to me and talk to all of us. I mean, you, you mentioned in, in your discussions before that the writer is, or the author is the avatar. Who is the reader to you? So in a memoir, I see the author's journey as a, the hero's journey as it is in memoir, or excuse me, as it is in fiction. So the author in a memoir serves as the reader avatar. And then the reader is putting themselves kind of in the shoes of the author and going through that arc with the author and going through that. And it's a way for them to kind of test the waters and say, oh yeah, I'm in a similar situation. I like how this author thinks and, and the actions, the, the decisions that they made when they were under pressure that's the person that I want to be. Or, oh, wow, yeah, they made those mistakes. Man, I could see how I could make the same mistakes in that situation. How do I learn from what the author's going through so I don't make those mistakes in the future? So if if the author can, can be that avatar for the reader, that's a much more powerful, that's where the reader and the author are having that conversation as the author writes their their story and moves the reader through right. that narrative arc. Right. So in let's say in life's arc, in life's script, when does one really decide, I want to write a memoir? 
because suddenly it seems to be a, a, the buzz of the of the last 10 years 15 20 years everybody wants to write a, a, a memoir and uh, and for me it never dawned on me i mean I, it was it was so studded with failures and and flaws that uh, <laughs> couldn't see anything else uh, outside of the mirror but it was a time when you know you hit a crisis or your life has just gone and, and I don't think everybody wants to wait till the age of 70 and start writing memoirs because they'll be too late and anything can happen and it will be incomplete. But is there an age where someone dawns and just, you know, just decides time to write one? I mean, when does that turning point in life happen? Yeah, it's funny. It happens for different people at different times and there's different motivations. So one of the, the things that I come across often is people will come to me or when I'm at a party or someplace social and people ask me what I do and I start to describe that, they'll say, you know, when I tell people my story, people say, oh, you should write a book, meaning a memoir, right? And I think that I've only seen that work out a couple of times and work out well. I think that writing a great memoir is something that bubbles up inside of a person and they can't not do it. But there's a powerful motivation for it because it usually is that they have gone through, well, there's two, two reasons. The, the good one, and I'm making a value judgment here, so anybody can disregard if they don't agree with me. But the one that I see is, as the, the good motivation is that they've gone through this traumatic thing and they've really learned and grown and wrestled with themselves and made a significant change and it's all they're they're like a mentor and they say man here i see this need out there that there's other people going through this thing i have a unique experience and i have something that i would love to share with people to help them either to be a support for them as they walk through their journey or to be a mentor in some ways to them as kind of a warning of like hey you don't want to go down this path and so that to me is like a really good, powerful motivation. There's another motivation that I see a lot in memoir, and that is somebody who wants to just rant and they feel like they've been abused in some kind of a way and they just want to get back at people. So to me, like I said, I'm making a value judgment here. I think that's a poor motivation for writing a memoir, but it's definitely a motivation that I see often. And I'll just leave it at that. And you can ask me more questions about that if you want me to, or we can move on. <laughs> no, 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 because you've hit the, a point in the intangible aspect of it, and that is intention. Uh, yeah. Because if you have the wrong intention, it's going to rub off in the wrong way. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, you're saying? No, no. And that was another thing that you said about as, as a doctor, as a surgeon, first do no harm. I 100% agree with that because... To me, so I grew up in a home without a television. We had hundreds and hundreds of books. So we didn't have a television until I was 17 years old. So I have this almost religious thing about books and authors. So to me, books have books are special things and authors are special people. And so to me, when I see somebody kind of come on that turf and do something with those tools, you can, you can kill someone with a scalpel or you can change their life for the better. The same thing with books. So when I see somebody come on to, to kind of my turf, wielding the same tools that, that I wield and others wield to try to make the world a better place and to ease people's suffering, and they're contributing to that suffering and tearing things down, I get really mad about that. I have really strong feelings about that. I don't like it. Yeah, point taken. I mean, if you'll if you'll take it in and and let it make its own uh, turf, you know, you know, in someone's life, listening in. But uh, now, I just want to quickly clarify something. So, I'm writing my memoir. So, do I call myself a writer, or is it after the book is published and then I say I'm an author? Yeah. So that's a great question. There are many different perspectives on this. Mine is that you are not an author until the book is published and you can hold it in your hand or it's for sale. And the reason for that is twofold. One is, so a lot of people will encourage people who are writing their books to call themselves authors to kind of fulfill that aspiration. It's a very aspirational thing. 
I don't disagree with the motivation behind that, but what happens is if that person is not writing as fast as they think they should be, if they have any kind of guilt that they're not making progress, that label of author actually becomes something that creates shame for them because they're like, I'm not fulfilling that, that uh, moniker. The other thing is if you're talking to somebody and you describe yourself as an author, their expectation is that they could go and purchase your book straight away. So if they say, oh, that's great. Where can I buy your book? Then you have to backtrack and explain, well, I mean, it's not actually out yet. I'm in the process of writing this thing. And then there's another side of it for me that's just sort of a respect of the profession. And if somebody described themselves as a doctor or a surgeon and they had not finished their training and they had not gotten their certifications, I mean, people would laugh at them. So it's funny to me how we think that in a creative field, we can kind of massage these phrases and, and use them. To me, it's not authentic to say that you're an author if you haven't actually fulfilled the mandate of an author, which is to finish a book and have it up for sale. That's the short answer. <laughs> no, and it makes sense. And it takes out the whole imposter stuff to it. You're yes. walking around. Right. And, yep. uh, and so I'm going to tell my girls to stop putting the book around so I can carry it around. <laughs> 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 but, but you know, you know, Chris, and what you are saying are gold nuggets, because it is a journey, and uh, you know, they're, they're, it's so f- unfortunate that in this part of the world, nobody is out there really telling the story and spilling the beans, uh, because uh, it's an it's not so much of an art, but like you said, it's a craft, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's something that we can learn, as opposed to being difficult to be taught. I mean, you got to learn the the trade. Uh, to be able to do it. And so I just, I'm so delighted that I, I've met you in my life on this journey of putting this book out. And I can tell you one thing, I'm going to run all over town with the book and say, look, look, it's here. <laughs> you know, those days in England during the war, here's the press, out from the press, you know, later, right. take the latest. <laughs> and I'm going to stand somewhere in town with a kind of thing and tell my girls, go, yeah, get the book, it's out, it's hot, you know. But, <laughs> but you know, you know, Kristen, one of the first subjects we learned in medicine is called anatomy. Mm -hmm. And if you don't study the anatomy, the physiology and the biochemistry, you're out of the system. You you don't know where you are. And so I want to just now drift. We have taken us to the spirit of the era of the writer behind the writer kind of thing, the mind behind the mind. And now we come into the mechanics of it, the anatomy of it. And I know that there's so much we can learn from you. But what's the goal? How does one decide the goal into the end point? Is that goal where I want to go and where I want to end? Or is it a goal of where I want to take the reader to start with and where the reader is going to end? Because I tell you one thing, you made a statement, which to me is absolutely powerful. It it shook me. It took me a while. I just said put for about five minutes when you said at the end, the reader wins. And I always thought that it's me winning at the end because, yeah, I did it. You know, that kind of feeling, right? <laughs> but when you said that, I said, now, this girl is different. I mean, you know, you're, you're looking in it totally from a reader's mind. Uh, and, and what does it do to someone else? That, that interaction, that interplay between two souls that are trying to find purpose in life. So talk to us about the importance of vision of where this book wants to go. How does one deal with that? Yeah, I like to reverse engineer things. So I think with memoir, it's great because we know the arc of our story. We know our life. So it's unlike a novelist who might have to think about, they might not always have the end in mind when they write the book. Memoirists typically have a pretty good idea of what they want to talk about. So I I recommend to my clients and when I teach workshops is to, okay, step back and think about who is it that is from a reader's perspective, who is it that's going to want and need or be interested in your story? What are they suffering through right now? What what is going to bring them to your story? And what is it about you as a human being, as a whole person, that's going to connect with them as a human being and as a whole person? And really, the way that the reader wins in the end is that 
that you are connected to them and they're, you are the reader avatar. So they are seeing themselves go alongside with you. Just like when we watch a film, the whole idea is that, that the film hooks the viewer in to align themselves with the protagonist. And then they experience the highs and lows with the protagonist. And if the protagonist wins in the end, the viewer feels like they've won in the end. If something bad happens to pr the protagonist in the end, the, re the viewer still might be satisfied with the movie, but there's that emotional thing, like as if it happened to them. So if we're always thinking about who am I serving when I write this book and thinking about the details of my story and the, the little bits and pieces that are best going to speak to those people, then we can really start to develop a decision-making rubric that helps us to weed through a lifetime of experiences and possibilities that we could put into this memoir, especially the older we get, the more we have to choose from and the more yeah. daunting it can be. Telling so me. Thinking, <laughs> yeah. But I will say that for the most part, I do think that the better memoirs come from people who are 40 and above um, because there is more depth of experience and they've had more time to think about things and experiment with things and figure out what works for them, what aligns with their belief system, all of that. Not that a younger person can't write a good memoir. I've read some by younger people, but it's typically a more survivor memoir kind of a thing. You know, it's it's a very narrow thing and it doesn't go as deep into the psyche of a person and their relationships. Uh, that's a generalization, but but I do I do think that the older we get, the better we can write because we have more of a well to pull from. Yeah, and and drink from, and uh, and uh, and so if I'm hearing you right, Kristen, that the topic is more important than the author in memoir. Would that be? I think so. Yeah, because um, you know, like for example, it, it goes both ways. You know, I remember uh, sometimes you you look at some of the top bestsellers. The topic is not something that somebody will be looking for, but it's either the subtitle or, or, or something else that draws it in. Uh, and the topic might be way out. But when does one decide on the topic? Is it at the end of it when it's all over and say, OK, this is something or right in the beginning? I'm going to write about this. Yeah, to me, it's in the beginning. So this kind of brings up the conversation about plotters and pansters, or yeah, pansters. Have you heard those phrases? No, uh, pranksters, yes, but not pansters. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in the U.S., at least, there's this phrase about plotters, and they're the people who plan everything or most things from the beginning, and they know what they're going to write, and then they write it. And then there's the pansters who write from the seat of their pants. That's the expression. Uh, okay. They just dive in and just follow their bliss, follow their whatever they want to do. And those are two opposite approaches and they can both work equally well. This is why I think you have to figure out how your brain works and, and what your preference is. For me, I'm a plotter. So, and as a developmental editor, you can teach plotting because it's anatomy. You can teach anatomy where you can't teach about panstering because it's very ethereal, right? Um, so what I say is, okay, you've got to figure out what exactly is it that you're trying to talk about because you've got this lifetime of experiences to choose from. So we've got to narrow the scope and it's going to typically be something that you're going to have. It's similar to fiction. It's going to follow the hero's journey. You know, what was the inciting incident? What was what was that big moment where something changed in your life, either a tragedy or an opportunity that set you on this course that you're going to describe to the reader? And where does that story start and where does it end? So I'll just give you an example because that can be kind of hard to pin down. So one of my clients is a Black police officer in the Midwest, and he was fired from his job, and then he got reinstated. So that story really started before he got hired as a police officer, what his plans for his life were before that, what led him to join the police force, the arc of his career, then these things happening along the way that set him up for this big crisis when he got fired, and then how he turned that around and got reinstated. And then the book ends just right after he retired. So we had this 
this nice narrative arc and we knew exactly where we were going to start the story and where the story was going to end and everything in the middle when we asked ourselves like should this go in there should this go in there it was like yeah. well what does that have to do with the story that we're telling which is about you know systemic racism in the United States, even in the police force, and from the perspective of a Black police officer in the midst of culturally when police officers are, we're hearing more about police officers negatively impacting the Black community, that kind of thing, right? So, so right. he had a unique perspective as a Black police officer, and we were telling a specific story. So I always say you've got to figure that out because you're also not going to know who your reader is, unless you know what story you're going to tell. And so that way it was like, we knew exactly who would be interested in this book. You would have police officers that would be interested in his perspective. You would have people who are interested in like the social justice movement and, and uh, you know, equality and civil rights. So there were, there were very specific demographics of people that we could pinpoint that would be interested in a book like this looking for it. And we knew that they would win in the end because we had started it in the right place and we ended it in the right place. Oh, that's a powerful illustration of that, that arc, that journey. Because Now, so is the na narrative arc and the character arc the same? Because it's the character that, that tells the story and pulls the reader all the way through, right? Yes. Yeah. And so that's the other thing is a lot of times people think that it's about what's happening around them. And that's what the story is about. But that's not what the story is about. The story is what happens in you, yeah, not to you, because you can put the same two people or different people in the same situation. One of them is going to figure out a way to get through that. You know, another one won't grow at all. They'll just grouse and moan or whatever and won't grow. So, so different people are going to deal with the same situation in different ways. That's the magic of it. And so actually what you were saying a bit ago about, is it the topic that's the most important? Actually, it's not because that's just the situation. It's it's what happens to the person. It's that It's that personal growth, that character arc that's the most important. And that's why you can read something or talk to somebody and they can have this super dramatic story that's all drama, but it's not interesting at all because it's all drama and no growth. And then you can have somebody who is like in the most boring of circumstances, but something about the way that they think about it and the way that they, they grew through it is like is mesmerizing and you could listen to them for hours and it's kind of surprising because you're like but it it seems so boring because there's no fireworks there's no fighting there's no whatever <laughs> you know yeah i mean you know really this is you know the, these are so important issues which i'm going through uh of where to put the block in and what to do first and uh mm -hmm. and you know powerful you you recommended a book and i was just looking at the synopsis of it and it was this lady who had a, a triple amputee uh, and who had, had you know, met with a crash. And uh, and it, it's the title doesn't draw you as much as the subtitle and how she struggled through it being, a, you know what I mean? And yep. it's it's stuff like that that really takes you out of your seat and want to go and sit in a corner somewhere and mm -hmm. uh, take you. But but let, let's, let's look within that arc. I struggle with this part of it because... I think no book cannot be written without emotions. Uh, yeah. Somewhere along the line, the the whole emotional vulnerability uh, of the of the of the writer uh, becomes exposed. Mm -hmm. And every time I go into that area, I get up and go for another glass of wine. And so, when, by the time <laughs> by the time I'm finished, I'm too high to write anything else. <laughs> and uh, now, tell me, uh, Kristen, listen to me. There are many who are in that position of struggling to get into how deep do I go? Mm -hmm. And does the reader want to know how deep that is? Because you don't want to leave the re reader halfway down the cave and, and tell them, okay, go the rest of the journey and see, you know, you figure it out what happened, you know, that kind of yeah. thing, right? How do you go in so deep and yet come out, but still lost? Uh, I, are you able to, to feel me where I'm going with this? I think so. So I like to think about it from screenwriting. So a lot of what informs my process as a writer and an editor of nonfiction 
is studying fiction and screenwriting in particular. So in screenwriting, there's this idea about you're, the viewer of a move, movie is seeing something from the third person, from an outside view. And the only way that they know what's going on inside characters' heads and what they're feeling emotionally is by the actions that the characters take. And I really like that because the phrase is action shows character. And I think that if memoirists think about it that way and they approach writing and they write in scenes and they stop focusing so much on telling the reader, I was really mad. I was really sad. I was depressed. What did that look like? If, if you weren't allowed to tell the reader how you were feeling or what was what your mind was going through, how would you show them that on the screen? Right. And it's actually a lot easier than you think because people people are pretty um, transparent, actually, when they're going through stuff, even if they don't see it. And I'm sure many people can uh, resonate with this. For me, when I'm really mad or overwhelmed with something and I don't know what to do, I get very quiet. I will go and clean. I will go off by myself for a couple hours, but I will make the choice to disengage from humans and do something with my hands, right? Well, most people, if they see the lead up to that kind of behavior, and then you show them that, they have enough experience in and of their own self or with other people around them that they go, oh, <laughs> I, I know what she's thinking. Yeah, right. And you don't want to hear it out loud. But you know what I'm saying? So I think that that can be a way for the for the writer to step back from what they're writing to look at it and go, okay, if I was looking at this on a movie screen, is there enough action that I've written in, enough interaction between people to show what I'm feeling and what I'm going through? Um, and that's enough. And I think that's the other thing is that sometimes we do want to be authentic and we do want to give a lot of ourselves, but sometimes you can just go too much. You've made the point as far as the reader's concerned and you can move on. But there's just that sense of, well, I can always go deeper and deeper and deeper. And then we just get into where, you know, your memoir is 200,000 words and wanders all over the place. Yeah, yeah, right. So does that does that help answer the question? No, no, I, no. I, I tell you that that uh, takes you out from the labyrinth of being lost. You know, mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do is get the reader into a lostness that uh, they sometimes they may not be able to come back at all and go and get another mm -hmm. book to read. But uh, but yeah, we're beautifully uh, illustrated. And uh, and you mentioned something, the hero's journey, um, as opposed to a hero's story. You know, the word story sometimes puts me off because it's like once upon a time kind of thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> but a journey is a, where does this end? You know, what's the destination? So that hero's journey, does every arc need to be a hero's journey? No, but most books and most memoirs are a hero's journey. Okay. Because, because they just are. People read memoirs to learn something, to grow. If it's the story that somebody's telling of things that went wrong and it ends on a, yeah, now I'm destitute and um, I have no friends, no family, I've completely screwed up my life. That's a that's a cautionary tale, but the reader doesn't win in the end. It's like, oh wow, I've I've invested all of this time and energy into this this author in this story. What am I supposed to do with this? Right. You know, and so there's no there's no reciprocity in a story like that. So there's some excellent novels and screenplays and things that do have a negative arc, but they're satisfying in their own way. And they, they illustrate points about humanity and our lived experience um, in a different way. To me, memoir, I'm trying to think of a memoir that doesn't follow the hero's journey and nothing is coming yeah. to mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I hear you. Um, you know, it's, it's really so much about at the end of the day, your destination and where you want to take the reader. Um, mm -hmm. I remember seeing, I tell you something, I, I, I watch Netflix quite a bit when I'm stuck writing. Uh, and, uh, and it's amazing how those scenes of every, you know, they interplay, when they, especially the ones that have seasons to them. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's magic because before I can want to get up and go, I'm pressing the next one. 
the next episode you see so because it leaves yeah. you hanging you know mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and i think it's a brilliant way um there's another movie that i saw on netflix called where the crow dead sings or something like that oh yep oh, 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 oh perfect perfect and uh, you know at the end of the day you know it's in the poem you know that she's the one who did it so yep. so i think um, it it makes life fascinating when you can write it you know if life is the one's biggest project why not write it you know i <laughs> yeah and i think that when we step back and think about memoir as a hero's journey then we start to think of our life as a hero's journey and we can now maybe it's just me because sometimes i have a hard time figuring out how i feel about things and it's hard for me to process some things some things i'm a delayed processor in a lot of ways and i'm very analytical so for me once i started to really learn about the hero's journey and i started thinking oh wait this applies to memoir then i'm thinking okay well you could actually just apply this to your own life and say oh i just had this thing happen to me if i was the subject of a movie if i was this character in a movie or if i was going to write a memoir about this what would my goal through this be and what are the steps that i would need to take to reach that goal and then when something really bad happens you almost get weirdly like excited about it because you go oh this is going to be great because you have to have those ups and downs in a in a hero's journey you know so you can think oh well where's this going to fit into my narrative arc how am i going to get out of this one in a way that's satisfying to me and can make for a good story later so i suppose in a way it's a way to gamify your life and <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> kind of compartmentalize. Yeah, I, I tell you, you know, <laughs> while you're saying this, you remind me of someone who plays the piano accordion. You know, you go, you go, blow the whole thing off, <laughs> and then she swings it on, and there's music every time they do that. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. and, and it also reminds you of how life can have its humor and yet its shame. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I had open heart surgery twelve years ago. um and as we come to the la- to the the last part of our conversation but one of the most humiliating and yet emotional draining moments uh in my life as a surgeon as a doctor is when i go for my checkups of my open heart surgery i'm at the counter and the number goes 3241 and it's very loud and they call my name dr edward charles rudner singham lee and there'll be like 70 people and all the heads turn and look at me what can a doctor also have this kind of problem you know and i said and i look i feel like turning around and say yes you know i walk in. <laughs> mm-hmm. and it moments like that that you realize that oh my goodness life is just but like vapor uh you are here today and gone tomorrow and uh, you know well we've done this this wonderful conversation and at the end of the day when it's all that said and done and the curtain has come down you've got this book where, where does a publisher come in yeah so There's a couple ways that people do it. One is the book the manuscript first approach, which is what I really like. In non-fiction, you can also do a just a book proposal, which is really just an outline of the book, an overview of what the whole narrative arc is going to be, and then chapter synopses, and you can pitch that to publishers, and sometimes they'll say, "Okay, yep, we want to do that," and then they'll tell you go off and write the book. So that's one way to do it. The other approach like I said that I prefer is the manuscript first approach and that is finish the book, figure out what it really is and what you really want to say and then pitch it to a publisher and and go from there. And so there are pros and cons. That's a deeper conversation. Happy to talk more about that, but that's kind of the first the first level sure, answer. Sure. Okay. So listen, um we've been through uh different emotional uh, ups and downs in writing a book and i can tell you one thing it's no easy task mm-hmm. um and what you have shared today is really really uh, for me uh is 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 a nuggets of one nuggets you know and i want to thank you so much kristen i know that uh, this is going to kind of stimulate many who are keeping getting up from the seat and you know i think discipline is also another thing right go sit down and write you know that kind of thing well you know <laughs> I like to think about it this way. So dis- you're right, discipline, but sometimes there's this thing called demand avoidance. And I think most people suffer from it, some of us more than others. 
And that is when we feel like there's a task that we're supposed to do, something in our brain goes, I'm not doing that. And there it puts up a barrier. So if we reframe it, and this is where I think always thinking about why you're doing something and keeping the reader in mind, if you have this strong pull of, man, I know that this could help these people and save them a lot of pain. And if your motivation is coming from that place, I think that's actually going to get you to sit down and do this because, because now you're out of yourself. You're out of your own insecurities and selfish motivations, and you're doing something for someone else. And that can often have a stronger pull to keep us in the seat. The other thing is that I think too many people, especially first-time writers, think that professional writers sit down and they write a book from start to finish, and then they hand it to a publisher and it's beautiful. And there's another phrase that I love, and that is writing is revising. And I actually, I hate to write the first draft of a book. Absolutely hate it. It is misery. It is torture. But I love, love, love to revise. And that's where the magic actually happens. So if you can just know that, yeah, you know what, whatever I'm going to put on the paper today is going to be terrible, but that's okay. Because once I'm done, I'm going to circle back and fix it. And I'm doing it for this, for the reader, it becomes easier and the motivation is there. And it's not something you just have to say, well, I'm going to discipline myself today and make myself sit in the chair because that's what I'm supposed to do. Cause you know, I'm going to treat myself like a four-year-old. I don't know. I just think it, it honors where you are in that moment. And it honors the relationship that you have or that you want between yourself and your reader. Oh, well, 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 well said, well taken and well uh, absorbed because uh, (laughs) it means so much. And, uh, you know, let's end here with um, who's your model writer or model author, somebody that, you know, sticks in your mind. And, And the reason why I'm asking is because sometimes you can read a book and it just sinks in, you know, I mean, it is like, there's so much, so deep that as a surgeon myself and how we had to go back to the World War I and, and understand how this man orchestrated and came, came up with flaps and reconstruction. Um, as, as a trade that you are so, you know, magnificent in, who, who, would, who is, does one person come to your mind that, look, I love the way this man or this lady writes, you know, you know is, is there a model yeah. that you will kind of like comes to mind? I think that... Cheryl Strayed's memoir, Wild, is one that sticks in my mind because structurally, like the bones of it, like you were talking about the anatomy of that book is so good. And the the journey that she went through and the way that she talks about it, everything about that book to me is fantastic. It really stuck out to me as far as Wild by Cheryl Strayed. And it's one that's, gosh, it's probably 10 or more years old, but- Uh That's a book that sticks in my mind for many good reasons. And then Cormac McCarthy's apocalyptic novel, The Road, is the most devastatingly beautiful book I've ever read. And it's it's really the story about the love a father has for his son. And it is it's just absolutely stunning and very difficult to read. But as a parent, it resonates with me. Um. Yeah, but there are so many good authors. And this is where I feel bad as a professional. I actually don't remember the authors of books very often. I remember the stories and the structure of a book more than I'll be able to recall the author. Yeah, 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 definitely. Because it's like, you know, Mozart, you remember the symphony, you remember the the Mm -hmm. piece that moves you so much and takes you so deep. But uh, but anyway, well well done. But uh, give me the second one again. The the, the yeah, the, Cormac McCarthy. Cormac McCarthy. Yeah. Okay. So the book is called The Road. Right. So we'll have that all up in the transcript so that people can just get to it. And uh, so you know, well, I could talk to you the whole year. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I love talking to you. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed yourself. Now, listen. How do those listening in get to you, Kristen? Because I mean, the whole world, I want the whole world to know that there's a girl called Kristen Iris. She she looks into someone else's iris. It's, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. How did they get to you? I mean, you know, you, you mentioned you have a website, Kristen Iris. I do. Com. Kristen Iris.com. And it's spelled C-R-I-S-T-E-N-I-R-I-S.com. I also have a YouTube channel 
which I'm going to to be starting putting a lot more videos on in the next couple of months. So nice. um, hang tight. There's some up there, but it's, it's getting revamped, but that's a good way to have um, those kinds of things. But also on my website, on my speaking page, people can go down and there's a list of past events. And many of them are podcasts or video conversations like this. So they can actually go like, I'll be putting this one on that page too, so that people can go to your YouTube channel and watch yeah. it there as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, well done. And um, you know, um, before we kind of say bye bye to you, which I just don't like. Um, <laughs> what what t- tell tell something to somebody like me, a first time person writing, uh, non you know, it doesn't write before non professional kind of thing. What's your just give us a couple of sentences that we can kind of like take hold in and be confident because that's the first important intangible. Uh, that that needs to be on set and that is have the confidence to do it and finish it. I think it would be to think like a child in that when you're first learning to speak, children don't have any, well, most children don't have any barrier or shame when they come to using those new words. They're just excited to use those new words and they just spew them out. And it's okay if they're in the wrong order and their grammar's not right. We get it. And as they as they learn and grow and in the craft of speaking and communicating their grammar, their syntax, all of that stuff gets better. So you've never done this before. You're not supposed to know what to do and you're not going to know what to do until you've completely done it. And you can look back and assess the things that worked for you. And that didn't work for you. It is a craft, you know, there are some principles to it, but you can come to it in your own way. And the only way to is through. So just have fun. That's right. Have fun. And uh, well, I'm having fun with you as long as you're nearby and, you know, <laughs> and walking down the road with me. So now let me <laughs> let me end, uh, Kristen. Um, I read this this morning, but it's actually part of the book on writing well by William Zinzer. And uh, he writes in a paragraph here by Henry David Thoreau, uh, who wrote the book called Walden. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and this is the words of uh, Henry. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I have not lived. I mean, to me, that is, uh, it sums up the whole, you know, spirit of writing and why do you want to write your memoir? And, and so on that note, I uh, want to wish you uh, all the very best. Thank you so much for joining us on Hard Talk. And, well, thank uh, you for having me. Uh, it's been a, in, an enormous pleasure. And I know that uh, you'll be the first person I will hope to read the book and then tell me, go write again. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be glad because writing is about rewriting. That's <laughs> right. You'll have fun, I promise. <laughs> I'll have fun, I promise. So, so from all of us here, from Mary and Heidi, thank you once again and, uh, and have a, a wonderful evening. And uh, for those of you who have just, uh, you know, listened to this whole episode, we've been an hour together. I could go on the whole day with Kristen, but you can imagine the wealth of an enormous experience she comes from. So once again, thank you for joining us on Hard Talk and we'll talk again. <laughs>